So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. All right. In this video, I want to talk about our spiritual battle here and how to fight. I think I talked a little bit before about our fight is spiritual, not physical. We destroy fortresses, not the flesh. But I actually want to talk a bit about how to fight this battle. Because when you come up to this fortress, you may be thinking you got to start kicking it down, climbing over it, throwing rocks at it to tear, tear this thing down. It's actually not how it works. You see, to the world, we're a bunch of fools, and we seem completely harmless. But we are actually very dangerous to a fortress like this. You see, it only takes one of us to come up to this fortress with a handful of seeds. And just not throwing seeds at the fortress even though you could do that but just kind of throwing the seeds up in the air as you walk around the fortress just throw them up in the air while you walk around it like you're going around Jericho right throwing the seeds up in the air and while you're walking you're just praying you know that God takes that seed and gets it through every little crack and crevice that's in that fortress and that it finds a way into, into the heart, into the soil, under this fortress here. Right? you just throwing it up, letting the wind take it, letting it get where it needs to go. And you're praying for rain. And that the rain gets through those crevices, finds a way into the cracks, gets into that soil to germinate that seed. And this is done... By you preaching the word, that's the seed, you praying, and you fasting. You doing these things, you're fighting in this spiritual battle, in this spiritual war, and those seeds will get in somewhere. And you see one that you got a big fortress like this. You know, Satan and his guards going around. And it's hard to find all the little seeds in this place. There's little nooks and crannies and cracks and crevices. and You're going to find every little seed. You might be able to find a bunch because you're throwing a bunch of it, right? But you're not going to be able to find it all. And even when we leave, you don't know how much seed actually got through. That may germinate later on. Could be some days, weeks, months, years, or even decades later. It finally germinates. Right? But once that seed germinates, this is basically showing you that this is all the work of God. Because when that seed actually germinates and it takes root, that brings forth a tree of life right in the midst of them. And it just rips up these strongholds, these fortresses, these citadels from the inside out. And it's all... The work of God, all to his praise and his glory, that he conquered another heart. And all you do is walk around throwing the seeds up like Johnny Appleseed, right? You're fighting a spiritual battle. And to the world, you look foolish. I'll actually bring some of that up. First, I'll talk about the seed being sown. Let's go to Luke chapter Eight, talk about the seed. Luke chapter 8. I 
verses 4 through 8 here. Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower. talking about a man throwing seed. I mean, he's throwing seed out on different types of ground, right? Different types of soil. And then in verses 9 and 10, the disciples are asking him what it means. And then when he explains what it means, I just want to focus on what he says the seed is. He says the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So you see what you're to be doing, like Paul says, is to be instant in season and out of season to preach the word. Right? And when we come over here to 1 Corinthians, there's chapter 1 here, verse 21, Paul says, you know let, let's go with starting at verse 20, because I want to make the point about to us, I mean, to the world, we look like foolish people. Like, what are you doing? What you're doing is a waste of time, right? But as it says here, verse 20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So you see, we're preaching the word of God, and it's by that foolish thing of trying to take down a castle by throwing seed up in the air as we walk around it. That looks pretty foolish, right? But we leave the work to God. Where they think, oh, you're not going to take us down by throwing seed at the walls of our castle. Yeah, but those seeds are going to take root underneath and rip through, right? Uh, you know what? Let's let's actually take a look at that. We can see some pictures of that. Let's look at uh, is there an E at the end of concrete? Yeah, there is. Okay, so let me just put that in. See if we got some pictures here. See, we got some little ones here through a little crack. You see these plants coming up through this the concrete. You see it coming through the cement, and eventually it can just completely destroy that sidewalk, that road, or whatever. Matter of fact, let's see if we can find some better pictures. Let's go through resilient. Plants. See if we got any cool ones here. Okay, it's actually giving us a picture of plants that are resilient. I wanted to see. Oh, there we go. Look at this. This dandelion here ripping up the tar. Look at that. This big lump just from this weed right here. It shows you also the dangers of weeds. Like you got to take care of weeds, but. If this is a good fruit, you planted a good tree here, the Word of God, it, it can rip it up. Let's see if there's some other ones here. I have to type in a different wordage. Let's try one more and I'll wrap this up. Resilient plants growing impossibly. Growing, let's put in impossible. Places. And of course, I spelled everything wrong. What the heck did I just do? That's going in. There we go. See what you, you throwing up seeds can produce something like here. Look at this one here. But a, like a little tree starting to grow right in the crack of this sidewalk here. Let's see if we got some other ones. I've seen some cool ones where a tree grew through an old car that was parked and left somewhere. Growing through fences. And I was hoping for some good pictures here. I'm not really getting many. Plants growing through stone wall. Let's 
see if there's anything here for this. Oh, you got plants growing on the stone wall over here. Over here. So that's a possibility there too. As you see, sometimes what happens is uh, the seed can get into a crack, like right here. And when it starts to grow and expand, it actually can separate the bricks and get into a cracks and break the little stones and everything. It causes a devastation over time. And I was hoping to see some good ones here. But uh, I think you get the point for the ones I've already shown. But uh, yeah, that's all you got to do. You just preach the word while they're there up there on the castle walls, you know, being weird, saying things like, I hate that God that doesn't exist, and I fart in your general direction, right? They're, they're mocking and taunting you, and you just throw and see you up in the air while you walk around the castle, listening to them mock and throw tomatoes at you, right? You just do your thing, and then uh, you fresh. Fast and pray for the, those those people, for the seed to get where it needs to go. And it's all God. You cannot tear this down by your own power and might. You can't reach through these people. You can't make them accept the word of God or anything like that. You can't do anything except for throw the word of God out there and pray. And it's God who does the rest. Right? And if we don't do it, it says the stones will even cry out. And that's something you can pray for, that these stones that this fortress is made out of actually starts crying out, telling them about the word of God. And that actually can be done. Because you see, a lot of the, these stones and this fortress is built up on lies. So let's say it's like a lie of evolution. And these atheists are studying evolution. And they start to see all the stuff in it that disproves evolution the way that we're taught it where things improve and become more complicated when in reality things are falling into disorder and becoming less complicated where there's less and less information in the dna as time goes on right and you see this in the breeding of dogs and horses and such things you see a loss of genetic information and things are just getting worse so that itself, the stones are crying out, letting them know with these stones of lies that it's not true, right? And they have a stone wall about there being no God, and then it's telling them, hey, well, life can only come from something the living. Consciousness can only come from something conscious. So you are either not alive and not conscious because you came from some ooze on a rock that got hit by lightning, or you came from something that's alive and conscious. That that's the ultimate source. So you see, even the stones of their lies, when they focus on them, can cry out to tell them the truth. And that could cause the whole thing to have an earthquake and crumble down. But it's all a spiritual thing going on within the hearts and minds of people. As is... Jesus says in John chapter 3, you can't even see the kingdom of God, yet alone enter into it until you're born again. And that the kingdom of God, such as in Luke chapter 17, I believe it is, is not something that comes by sight, but it's something within you. So this can go crumbling down within somebody's heart and the kingdom of God established. Just like that. Like a snap. Right? So... With all that being said, get the whole armor of God on and get to work. Thanks for watching and take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos, encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures. As we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2, it says, Looking on to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. And this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith. An author is somebody who writes. And in Romans chapter 10, 
verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God in our world. It's God's representative in our world. And that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation. Have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this, ye do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? It is written to search the scriptures, bring them up. They testify of me, right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so, because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word, and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word in John 17, 17? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless. You want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit, and become one with his Spirit. 
And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the spirit of God and God's spirit is life giving as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word, it is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7 to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name. They're prophesying in his name. They're casting out devils in his name. They're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as... Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. And there was a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump 
is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass, and all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying this guy's not a Christian, you never listen to a thing I say, because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking and guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? <laughs> didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? If you ever saved, you were saved like that.